we have the pleasure of welcoming Johannes Rubhak to our interview series. I am Drishti Shah from the Ingati team and let's just begin with a quick intro of Ingati. So Ingati is the world's leading open multilingual no-code chatbot platform which is available across 14 channels with 25,000 bots created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. We run the Ingati blog and the video channel which receives up to 200,000 visitors annually. And now for our guest, uh, Dr. Drew Hug is an international coach and his interests lie in a vast range of topics from emotional competence, agile business and leadership. He helps build competent teams and helps understand the limits of using the latest technologies to build an even better team. Welcome, Johannes, and we are really thrilled to have you here. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure as well. So uh, we'll start with the questions that we have. So what do you believe are the opportunities and challenges for technology today? And where do you see it evolving for business five years from now? Well, from my vantage point, um, and that comes from my background, that I focus on optimizing how people and technology collaborate in a safe manner. The opportunity and the challenge are identical. The opportunity is to have people and individuals collaborate better and safer with technology. And, and that is also the challenge because we see that that is not yet the case. Technology is still too much, too far away from people to understand on the one hand. And on the other hand, yeah. there is a lot of... Um, misunderstanding about what that technology is actually doing. A lot of people still have the black box yes. thinking. There is something somewhere and that does something and I will wait and see. And that is the bridge we have to build, that people yes. understand what the technology does, how to use it in a safe manner, and then get better at doing their job or get better at supporting others or get better at supporting uh, providing services and that should also be a company thought philosophy to provide better services by using better technology yeah. at the same time make sure that we do that in a safe way that's right so challenges and opportunities you know go in parallel you need to say exactly and if we then look forward five years from now my expectation is that we see the winners, the, the, the growers in the market that are either the so-called disruptors that come up with a solution that nobody else has and they can do that very fast, mm. or the existing companies who catch up with combining human potential with technical solutions yeah. and do that in a way that the people are actually supported and not confronted. And, and that is my expectation for the next five years. That's why you will see the winners. We see something very interesting in the market. We have agile business development. We have agile methods. We have rapid deployment. And at the same time, we have cybersecurity, which basically needs you to have a big picture, long vision. And, and we, see, um, we see security officers being responsible for taking out those vulnerabilities one after the other and making sure that uh, the data and the services are protected. That's a long-term activity. The Agile method is much more focused on getting the results now as we need them today. The people who will win the digital transformation are the people who are capable of combining those two different, sometimes conflicting interests. And that's where you will see the winners in the next five years. So where do you think we are standing right now in the bridge? Like, where is the gap now? Are we going to that stage or where are we standing right now? We're starting. We're starting to get to the point that we realize it's not about what the technology is capable of doing. It is about what the people working with the technology are capable of doing and how the technology can support them. That's, that's a starting point. Um, the challenge is, is that the technology is, is developing very fast. It's, yeah. it's like a, a waterfall coming all over us. 
So people have challenges catching up with that. But there are wonderful examples of the way it should be done, and it's actually done. Um, there's one thing I always mention always in my, in my workshops as well. One example, uh, Wien Energie, a Vienna energy supplier, created some three years ago a simple chatbot for their service portal. Now, at first, hardly anybody was using that. Last data I've seen is more than 40% of their service requests is handled by the chatbot. And that means two things. Apparently, 40% of the people are rather happy with the chatbot, which is good, and it's a growing percentage. And secondly, it means that 40% of the workflow, which would normally have been handled by support people, is now being handled by a chatbot. And yeah. that means those support people can focus on more, uh, more important matters. And that's the winning part. That's, but we're still at the beginning of creating that winning part. We will see more, I'm convinced. We will also see a lot of examples where it's not done that well. So what do we learn from those things? But um, Wien Energie is one of those examples who picked it up early and did it as a surface gesture and then reaped the business benefits from it. A 40% surface request through a chatbot, thumbs up. That's well done. Yeah. Yes, that's actually... Uh... It saves a lot of time and efforts with, exactly. when it's handled through conversational intelligence. Exactly. And it leads to a high customer satisfaction because you will see a split in people. You will see a segment of people who say, hey, I want to an answer to my question and I don't want to wait 10 minutes on a phone call until I have somebody who I then have to explain everything five times or yeah. whatever it is. And you see, on the other hand, a part of the population that says, no, I want to talk to a person. So the winners will be the one who can who can mix that, who can find that solution. And, and you yeah. will see solutions that will say, well, you start with a chatbot. It will give you some smart questions and not just commercial stuff. Um, it will ask you some smart questions. Okay. And then it will say, hey, we cannot fix this. Do you want to talk to a person? Those will be solutions that we start seeing. So that can actually bridge the big gap that we have. Exactly, exactly. It's people, technology, technology, and people. And we cannot, and hopefully we'll never move away from that because otherwise people yeah. become useless. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So uh, moving on to, so with the constant developments in AI to automate the business, so how important is this combination of humans and technology? Like you just mentioned. So. How important uh, the gap, uh, you know, the combination should be or the collaboration should be? And where are we right now with that collaboration? Well, that, that collaboration is, is crucial. And you see it um, when, we, when we think about office environments and we think, think about standard services. It becomes very clear to see how technology and AI and human beings can collaborate. But let's take it one step away from that. And let's just look at a production facility, factory. You have a lot of machines, and you will have machine operators, and you will have technical specialists, and you will have maintenance people, you will have supply chains. If we put that in a so-called digital twin, so we have basically a digital copy of the process and a digital copy of the supply chain and a digital copy of the maintenance plannings and, and the maintenance priorities. <clears throat> and we put artificial intelligence in place and we put smart forecasting in place, but we also put smart analysis of what is actually happening in the facility at that moment during production, industry yeah. 4.0. We can then reach a point, and there are some interesting pilots already happening, we can reach a point where the system operator at the moment that a machine has an issue or is going to have an issue, even better, the machine operator gets a piece of information that will help the machine operator to prevent or to solve this problem without having to guess or go through all the steps or push a lot of button. Yeah. Really focused on the information that the person needs at that moment to make a smart decision. Yeah. 
And what you will also see in the future is that artificial intelligence and machine learning will be the noise cancellation facility. We get so much information, we get so much data that for us as human beings, it becomes close to impossible to process that all at once. Yeah. And we keep adding sources of information. If, if I look at a, a factory which, which I worked in 20 years ago and I go back to that same factory now, I, I cannot believe how much information, how much sensors, how much smart devices are there. But yeah. the people still have to respond to it. So if we overload them with information, they will not know what to respond to. Yeah. Technology can be the noise cancellation function. Take out all the information which is not relevant at that moment, highlight the information which is relevant at the moment, and say, hey, Mr. Smart Human Being, please make a decision. Please decide what the next step will be. And that makes a significant difference. You learn something, you practice something, and it becomes part of your team. Now something changed. Yeah. Now you have to relearn. You have to forget the things you learned in the past and learn something new. That's difficult. That's complicated. Yes. The way technology is developing at the moment, that's basically something you almost have to do every day. Now, technology can help us by filtering out everything that's not relevant, focus on what's relevant, and that yes. learning process becomes much easier. It becomes yes. data-driven. It becomes based on facts. And then we can make the information actionable. Mm. And, and those are the, are the developments. And I do not believe that AI will replace people. I believe and I'm convinced that AI will support people and make people um, able to do smarter things, more efficient things, yeah. uh, more effective things, and, and less guessing. Yeah. So you mean to say that the uh, junk data or something which is still we are capturing on our side, so AI and ML will always help us eliminate that and just concentrate on things that we have to look at. And provide exactly. that. There's a, there's a very interesting phenomenon when we look at collected data and it is increasing. We collect more and more data because we can collect more and more data. More than 90% and some, some reports even say more. Yes. Much more. More than 90% of the data we collect is never used by anyone. It's collected for the purpose of collecting. And that has two reasons. Yes. Reason one is we collect data because we can, not because we need it. And number two is we collect data, but we don't know what to do with it. Well, AI and ML can do a lot in accessing that data, finding, um, finding the trends, finding the precedents, finding the correlations and present that correlation to you instead of you having to go through all the data. Mm. If, you look at, if you look at the amount of reports that companies have and then compare that to the amount of reports that they actually use, you yeah. will see maybe one in 10 reports, sometimes even more or sometimes even less. They're not actively using, they have it, but they're not actively using it because it's not supporting them or it's not providing the information that they need. If you have like, for example, conversational AI, which you can just tell what kind of information you need and AI present that to you. And you look at that and you say, um, please filter out this, please search for that. Like we see in, in the Star Trek uh, series that the person is having a conversation with the computer and the computer is presenting the results in a conversation, the way that we are used to work and think. Yeah. That will help us. That will help us do the smart things based on the smart information. So which technology do you think will uh, help us in bringing this transformation? And like, what factors will be supporting that technology forward? Well, the first thing, the first technology that will actually help us a lot with digital transformation is um, every level of, of smart data analysis that we, can, that we can bring. So that can be ML, that can be AI, but that can also be just 
smart um, data collecting tools. It doesn't always have to be artificial intelligence. I have a wonderful um, slide saying, if it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably artificial intelligence. A lot of what, a lot of what we call artificial intelligence isn't artificial intelligence. But the artificial intelligence between the data and the information, because that's always the separation I make. Data is data points. I don't know what to do with them either. Information is something I understand, and I understand what I am expected to do. That's a key yeah. um, enabler for a digital transformation. The second part of technology is making all those processes much more cloud enabled so we can access anytime, anywhere, any how we want, instead of an on-prem solution by which we need either physical or, or encrypted access to that on-prem. That will help us a lot as well. And the third technology, and it might sound strange, is the accessibility of all the things we have. We have, and I don't know the percentages, I'm at the moment researching that. It's, it's my, my goal for 2020, my personal development goal. Um, there is a certain element of our population which doesn't have access in the same way that you and I have that. And that could be people with dis disabilities. That yeah. could be people which do not have the digital connection in our uh, connected uh, society. How are they going to benefit? How are they going to be included in the way that we are moving forward so extremely fast the way that we are doing today? Those are important questions. Um, I try to do that for myself by asking myself questions. Um, I'm 58 years old now. I need reading glasses. Okay, I learned to accept that. It's no longer that I can read everything without anything. I need aid to just read something. And I read a lot. I read even more than I write. And I write a lot. So reading is an important part of my life. And now I need an aid. I'm not going to say reading glasses is a disability. I don't mean that. What I mean is I already depend on the part of technology to do something that other people can do without that technology. Right. And then I try to impose that on other things in my, in my analysis and asking questions. I, I ask my dear friend and mentor, Deborah Rue, a lot of questions. She specialized in this. So, how can we make sure that everybody is involved and not just that happy selected group of people who don't need aid, who don't need help, who don't need everybody, everybody who is part of our society, everybody yeah. who has a right to enjoy the technology, who has a right to be a working person contributing, um, everybody who has the right to lead a normal life. And that's going to be a big challenge because we still, if, if we look at uh, all the new launches and all the new products, there's still a major focus on that group of people who don't need the aid and who do have uh, the digital connection and who do have access to anything we need. Yeah. So uh, two questions on the two technologies that you told me. First thing is the cloud. So. Um, there's still a, you know, kind of insecurity people have when, you know, shifting to cloud technologies, mostly regarding uh, how will their data be used and if it is getting stored somewhere, they do not trust the sources. So what, what can be the measures to, uh, you know, have people shift to cloud, especially in this pandemic that we are facing, it would have been really helpful. When, if they were using cloud, uh, cloud as a technology, so. Well, this is what we now see is we're being smacked, literally in the face, by one of the biggest mistakes we have made in technology in the past twenty years. The thing we have forgotten to do 
is to include the people who have to work with the technology in understanding what the technology actually does. And it doesn't mean they need to be programmers or understand every line of code, but we failed to help people understand this technology works like that because of this. This is what we're going to achieve with this. This is why we want to do that. We focused on the technology and what it can do. So we have not involved the people working with it. And you see that in, in many examples. What I still see in a lot of companies is that they have a compliance-related annual check. Yeah. And they use that as training, but it isn't training. It's just a compliance form that they can put on the file that if there is an insurance claim or if the auditor comes by, yes, we did this. The second thing is that the people focus on what they have to do and they try to do what they have to do as good as they can. And they use different tools for that. It could be a spreadsheet, could be an ERP system, anything. But that focus is on what they must do with it. Yeah. We don't respond as long as they do their tasks. But we keep refreshing the tools and we keep adding new tools. And we do expect the people to keep doing their job. And as long as they do their job, we're not responding. What we failed to do is make them aware of, hey, um, if you get an email and we can talk about chat programs and, and social media and all the other platforms as long as we want, 93% of corporate corporation uh, communication is email. We failed to explain the basics of social engineering to the people who work with email. Social engineering is still the biggest threat. And we tell people, push this button, then that email will go there. We should, get, and you can use gamification for that. You, you should really engage people actively in, in understanding what is good and what's not good. What is a risk and what is not a risk? How should you act when you think there is a risk? That's what we fail to do. And therefore, we have created an environment in which people are reluctant. And, and they hear all kinds of stories about private data and data breaches. And so when you then say, oh, well, tomorrow you go to the cloud, people will say, okay, what's that? Or they will, um, after all the Facebook data breaches and... and, and, and um, I mean, the list is too long. We could spend hours just going through the data breaches of 2020, and it's only April. So people will also be concerned about that. And why are people concerned? Yeah. Well, in most cases, they are concerned because they don't understand. Or they get so much information that they don't know what to believe anymore. And what we should do from this pandemic, what we should learn from this pandemic is Educate people in a proactive manner and not by flow overflowing them with some with some documentation or some PowerPoints or educate them in an involved manner. Gamification is great. Um, focus on what people are working with and make sure that they have the knowledge to do that in the same safe way and an optimal way. Yeah. Focus on what people need to do their jobs, right? Um, why are we not focusing on the safety aspects of a cloud platform and explaining people what the safety features of that cloud platform are? Those are questions we should ask ourselves and, and fix that very fast. The thing is that we used to have a certain small percentage of people who are working remotely or working from home and, and, and they somehow got through. Now it's going to be 80%, if not more. So we're confronted very directly with the things we failed to do. Now let's pick that up. Let's start working on it. Exactly. And I, I say this a lot. If you, if you believe that anybody could have prepared for the, uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic, I don't think you have understood the problem. But you could have prepared much better for um, remote working, for 
um, a shift in your workflow. It's very interesting to see how many companies have bought over the last years, instead of desktop PCs, notebooks for their employees. And those notebooks are in the docking station and they stay there 24 seven because we could have prepared ourselves, our infrastructure and our people much better for the moment where they just take that notebook with them and how should they actually then respond and how should they access the information that they need. That's something we definitely could have been doing. Okay. And it is now good that we have so many people who already had notebooks as their, as their workstation, although they're not mobile. So it's, 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 a good, uh, it's a good fact. It helps us to reduce the impact. But we could have prepared better in some ways. And the biggest gap in preparation is preparing the people. And yeah, if you have to do that under pressure and at the same time fix your infrastructure and at the same time uh, prepare your your access portals and your VPN uh, connections and whatever, yeah, then it's uh, a bit too late. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also the second thing that you mentioned, that accessibility to everybody and not to a selected group of people who know technology or who are connected to technology. So what what can be the measures to, you know, reach out to the people or to the more common masses other than just people who are connected to technology? Like, how can they have access to this? Well, um, it's a very simple, I, I always use a very simple example. We speak a lot about 5G and what 5G is going to bring. And, and 5G is great. But if I just look at Germany, where I'm living at the moment, I know a lot of places and not a few. I know a lot of places where you are happy when you get 2G. There's no 3G, there's no 4G, and there will most likely for a long time not be 5G. Yeah. And Germany is a um, developed, highly industrialized, technology-focused country. Now, if I take that and look at how the spread of technology is, we see that it's mainly around the big cities. And then there is some, some uh, uh, urban urbanization around those big cities. And that's where the technology spread is. And as soon as you go outside, it becomes significantly less. If we transpose it on the entire world, we will see exactly the same. Now, if I am in a country where I have to work almost around the clock, just to be able to feed my family. How am I expected to have money to buy a device, to pay my monthly bills, to get access to all that wonderful technology, when I already have to struggle to just feed my family? And how do I expect government or service providers to make huge investments in 5G connectivity in an area which is populated by people who struggle to feed their families and simply don't have money to buy the devices and to... And that's the reality. We have to break that. Yeah. We have to break that circle we have to, and we look at when we look at the sustainable development goals, there's 17 goals. And I'm, I'm very happy that I worked with my friend Adam Rogers uh, the past two months on, on creating got a minute videos to explain each of those sustainable development goals. We talk about ending poverty, we talk about equality, we talk about um, connectivity. It's not just one thing, it's not about how fast the newest mobile phone is. It's not about how fantastic the newest 5G technology is. It is about the basics of people being able to feed their family, to have a normal quality life, well-being, healthcare. Oh yeah, and technology is great as well. The thing I always feel uncomfortable with is when we focus solely on the capability of, of the technology itself, but we do not pay attention 
to the access to that technology to everybody who doesn't have access to that technology today. Now, I spoke about people who have to struggle to feed their families. Let's take it one step further. Let's talk about the people who struggle to be part of society because, for example, they have a disability. How can we make all that technology accessible to them as well? How can we create a, a platform with, with a lot of important educational resources and optimize it so people with hearing issues or, or visual issues or whatever issues can still access, access it and can still educate them as anybody else who doesn't have those issues. How can we make sure? That I, I never forget this one very simple lesson I learned from my, from my friend Antonio. Um, if you put a dark background on the PowerPoint slide, you are doing 11% of the human population who are sensitive to bright colors a big favor. And the people who are not sensitive don't to bright colors, well, they don't really see the difference as long as you make sure that the contrast is there. So a dark background with bright text is not troubling people who do not have this bright color sensitivity, and it's helping people who have a bright color sensitivity. I was never aware of that. And it's a little thing. What I'm trying to understand is, is accessibility about a lot of those little things we're not paying attention to, is accessibility okay. about what my friend Deborah Rue has taught me, create accessibility by design, because if you do it afterwards, it's going to be very complicated, or is okay. accessibility taking the focus away from the optimal perfect customer and, and accept your responsibility that accessibility is about all the customers and not just that small selective few. And I think it's a combination of things. And I think it's a lot of the small things we can do. There will be a lot of design issues. There will be challenges when we have to do it afterwards, of course. But the first step, and I will never stop thanking my friend Deborah Rue for teaching me this lesson. The first step is accepting that you are responsible for accessibility. So adopt the technology to that. So just when it's designing, you always think about the capabilities plus the accessibility and only then it is much more successful rather than just focusing on the capabilities. Exactly. And, and the same applies to security. And, and that's the reason why I understood it so quickly. If I do not have my security considerations from the beginning, I'm in deep trouble if I tried to retrofit that afterwards. When I do not have my accessibility and, and my inclusion considerations from the beginning, I'm in deep trouble trying to put that in place afterwards. And it's basically the same consideration. It's just different, different challenges. Um, I heard a wonderful, wonderful story about how, for example, Disney in their Disneyland is focusing on accessibility and making sure that every person and every individual from different roles can still enjoy that particular experience. And they invest a lot of time in that. And they save that time and they save that money by the time they start building it because they have thought basically about everything. And they go through one session after the other until they are sure that a person in a wheelchair still has the opportunity to, uh, to enjoy this. And they, they, they think about other things. They say, hey, there's a family coming to visit us. Father, mother, two children. Great. The mother is pregnant. So she cannot probably go on this or this or this. What alternatives do we have? And they very actively design and they think about that. So they make sure that um, all their potential customers can have a wonderful experience. And that's the way it should be done. Yeah. So do you think um, now that 
we have this uh, pandemic so customer experience would be you know hindered at a greater level well customer experience has always been important but it has not made the decisive uh, change yet right in in many cases you are still um there is something like loyalty you stick with the same supplier although you may not have had the best experiences and there is still price which for many people is more important than the actual customer experience what we see now is because we have such a sh- sudden shift in our society people look at it in a different way um I'm not going to mention yeah. names but there have been a couple of pe- companies with a rather negative exposure in the press lately about firing people uh asking for bailouts yeah. although they have fired people so n- showing that they are not really part of society in the way that society would like them to be part of it on the other hand yeah. we saw companies with extremely good exposure by and i want to name a few of those um tesla under elon musk who is always doing the crazy things and he's always doing the things that nobody thinks is possible and nobody thinks is smart i on many occasion when he comes up with something i think okay what was he thinking but two weeks later i understand what he was thinking yeah. we have a crisis at the moment what does elon musk do he produces ventilators and he gives them out he could have made profit on it he could have he doesn't a uh, formula 1 amg team those engineers i think they are one of the best engineering teams on the planet and and they normally focus on something which i find very entertaining formula 1 driving but it's not really contributing to society what did they do in this crisis yeah. we design ventilators those companies have put themselves now in a perspective away from the customer experience but as a society driven organization customer experience will be influenced by that because customer experience we focus a lot on the technology but in reality it's an emotional aspect how do i feel about that company how do i feel about their services how do i feel about their Uh, platform how do i feel about what they deliver so those have suddenly added a positive emotion to the customer experience and that will last a very long time yeah. there are yeah. um suddenly heroes of society who may not have the best platforms and the best looking technology but they're there and people notice that and that will influence the emotion mm-hmm. if they are capable to improve in their portals in their services also the customer experience oh man the rest is going to have a hard time catching up with them because they will be a decade ahead of 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 the customer yeah. experience just because yeah. of the emotional value i do a wonderful workshop about um how we as human beings influence our understanding of facts by our own emotions it's called see the cow it's i recommend it to anybody because it will open your eyes on how your own emotions influence what you believe is true or not and those this is the moment where where companies and people can say can show what they're really made of and that influences uh, customer experience from my perspective in a in a much higher um arch my ratio than the actual technology behind it now back to the original concept of customer experience what matters is how do i feel during and after doing business with you do i feel that you respond to me hey great do i feel that you not taking me serious you can have the best technology in the world but if you provide me poor service i don't care about your portal if you provide me good service and made that nice and accessible and I enjoyed it and I want to come back that's when you win so customer experience is not just about the design and the look and the feel it's about the whole bundle of things and and then you can add and then you can ensure that people come back and they come back again 
and again and again, and that's how you win. So, uh, what will be the change of the face of this digital? Like, what will be more important, and what what would be at the forefront after this pandemic is over? Well, the, the forefront is what we are basically forced a bit to do, which which the experts have already been predicting. For the surface and office orientated functions, we will see more remote working. That doesn't always have to be work from home, but mm-hmm. that will mean a lot more flexible offices. It will mean a lot more uh, instead of everybody uh, huddling up in one big office somewhere in a very expensive office location that you can have a set of smaller offices spread around the city and make it more comfortable for your people and, and less commuting time. That's one of the things that we will see. What we will also see is that we have now finally learned and we were forced to learn that being able to access your surface from wherever you are is extremely important. And that applies to you, that applies to your suppliers, that applies to your customers. So what I expect is that that will improve much more and we will see the benefits. I've seen some very interesting statistics now already, but I also saw it with companies which I coached on remote working. That, for example, people who are responsible for surface calls, so actually taking care of the tickets, calling customers back, et cetera, et cetera, work significantly more effect, efficient when they are doing that from home instead of in a big office where they constantly have interruptions, they have meetings, the, 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 the colleague comes by, the coffee break. They do... 30 to 50% more tickets per day than when they would be in that same office with the, with the open office structure and all the disturbances. And that's what companies will learn out of this experience. Hey, it isn't all bad. Right. So those are the things, the things I'm expecting out of coming out of this. And the, the second thing that I expect, and that's unfortunate, Cyber criminals are hitting this hard because a lot of companies have not yet created the environment in which their employees and their clients and their suppliers can access their services from wherever in a secured manner. So I do expect that there will be a lot of issues and hiccups and that that will finally put the focus with the board of directors and, and, and with the auditors that it's not about compliance, it's about actual security. So I do expect in a few months we're out of this and then we will have a big cleanup in the field of cybersecurity. Yes, definitely. So um, regarding the cybersecurity measures that the organizations should be taking, so what exactly more steps that they can take to ensure that you know they are not missing out on anything and their systems are secure or something like that there, there are three steps they must do educate 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 the IT specialists yeah. to make sure that they understand that technology is evolving very fast and, and you cannot expect people to keep up themselves. And the IT people have to understand that. Educate the people throughout your organization that technology is changing and you need to pay attention to the security aspects. We cannot solve everything by technology. And unfortunately, we as IT people have been pretending that we can solve everything by technology. It's not. It's 80 to 90% of the issues are human issues and not technology. Yeah. And the third level of education is the understanding that there are certain steps you must do because of your responsibility. If I buy a car, I expect this, the, the manufacturer of my car to put safety features in it. And, and because I have, I, I have a family, I even buy additional safety features for that car. But that doesn't change the fact that I still have to re- drive responsible okay. because I have an airbag and an ABS and, and whatever kind of features in my car doesn't allow me to drive 250 miles an hour downtown. 
nobody in his right mind would say, yeah, that's great because you have the technology in place. This is the third yeah. level of education that, and that is not just people, that's not just companies, that's all of us. No matter how great technology yeah. is or isn't, it starts with our own responsible behavior. Now, what is responsible behavior? We yeah. can talk a lot about that, but we may have to make that accessible. That's right. Yeah, it's like uh, there should be a balance and it, and the key will always be humans. And that is why, you know, AI or ML or any technology will not be able to replace humans because that's where we have to stand in. Yeah. Exactly. There are basic things. If you look at business management, you look at risk acceptance, you look at risk appetite. Is a board of directors, is an executive suite willing to take a certain risk? Yes or no? Under which parameters are they willing to take that risk? Yes or no? What would be the budgets required to eliminate that risk? Those are business decisions. Now, you can put ML in place that identifies every potential risk. That doesn't automatically mean that the executives will say, well, stop the press, we're going to realign the entire available budget to solving those issues. That will never happen. So AI and L and all the technology we'll have can certainly help us to solve some issues. It can certainly help us to identify some issues. In many cases, due to the amount of information, much faster than human beings and, and analysts can do. Okay. But it will never replace the decision-making process when it comes to the budgets available to a company. Now, um, CISOs would really love to solve every issue, but they have limited resources. So they make decisions based on their threat analysis. And they say, this one is likely. This one is unlikely. This one is unlikely, but in case it happens, would cause enormous damage. And they make a decision on which one of those they will spend their money on. And, and those are, that's just the beginning of the decision-making chain. The second one is I have three fenders and one fender offers me this portfolio. The next one offers me that portfolio. And the third one offers me that portfolio. But I also have a budget available. So maybe I could take vendor number one with all the features I'm looking for. I just don't have the money for it. Business decisions are not always aligned with what technology could offer. So yeah. technology is never the only answer. And it will, I hope so, never be. A lot of people will disagree with it, especially the sales teams behind that technology will say it will solve everything. But from my vantage point, from a business perspective, and from a human leadership focused perspective, technology is a tool in the toolbox and can definitely support the decision making, but yeah. it will not drive the decision making. Coming to the power of technology and social media that we have. So uh, do you think that it should be a center pin in the digital marketing strategy? Social media can be that? In Definitely. Definitely, yes. And for many, many, many reasons. One reason is it allows us to interact and engage with, with the current customer base, with our potential customer base in a much more democratic way, in a much faster way. If, if I look just yeah. at television advertisement, I have to plan that in months on forehand, it will cost me a lot of money. And then I have this one spot in time fixed. And, and then I hope that everybody's watching. If I use social media, I can engage with my customer base and with my potential customers any time that they are available. And I can respond to the questions. Right. If I would be very smart and they criticize what I'm doing, I can respond to that. I can, I can say, hey, listen, I respect your opinion, but we believe that this and this is the case. Or, you know what? That's a very good point. And, and I am going to make sure that we discuss it on the next meeting. We can have 
a lot of that interaction, very, very fast, very, very direct. And we can find what is happening in the market, what is what is important to our customers by just engaging with them. Yeah. That makes it such a wonderful tool and so much better than just dumping your advertisement and, and your, uh, your, your publications on everybody. The engagement and the, the potential of a conversation. Um, we can look at trends. You, you can test things much faster. You can say, hey, people are responding to this. They're not responding to that. What's the difference? You can actually ask them. Yeah. And if you do that in a, in a proper manner, in a smart manner, it is amazing to see how many people are willing to respond to those questions. Yeah. Because you give them the feeling, hey, you're paying attention. I'm not just a user on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Somebody is talking to me. Somebody wants to know my opinion. Oh, well, well, let me give that opinion. You just have to get smart about it. Yeah. You have to make sure that there is always, because you can do, you can automate a lot and you know, wonderful things. But then you have to make sure that you pick up the moment when a person wants to communicate with you. Yeah. And, and not just have your automatic posting tools and, 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 and messaging tools. and Because then it will work against you. If a human being responds to you, to your post, or it was automatic, it comes from a script or, or, or an, a smart agent. And the person wants to communicate with you. You miss that, you lost a client for life. And then you have the emotional experience you created by communicating with you and not responding or only responding with your automated advertisement as some, some companies do. You've created a negative experience and that negative experience lasts for many years. Next time that person will see the name of your company or a post of your company, the person will remember the negative experience, not what you've told them. So that's where you have to also be careful with, with the pitfalls, with, with the potential risks. And that's again where we started the conversation today, the combination of technology and human potential. Find that mix, and, and that's where the winning are. That's where the profits are. That's where the business growth are. That's the growth mindset is about combining technology and human potential. And that's a lot of communication. Yeah. And uh, like it's always like uh, traditional marketing is, you know, like a UDP and social media is like TCP, you know. You can have it better with the social media. Yeah, the thing is, the thing is, the one doesn't replace the other. And if you do it smart, both sides are supporting each other. And both sides are growing together. And, and that's the way you should do it. You should always do it. Social media and social media advertisement and social media marketing and digital marketing is a little bit of a disruption of the marketing. So what? Embrace it. Make sure you're good at it. Make sure you understand it. Make sure that the people who are really smart in doing the digital marketing are a very well-respected member of your team, right? Um, and, and use all the benefits from it. Make yeah. sure that your social media campaign is supporting your conventional marketing campaign. And, and make sure that you have enough high-quality material to keep feeding that social media feed because the, the attention span is so short. If you post something once a month, nobody knows who you are. Nobody does. To so get a lot of people involved, get a lot of content out there, get the interactions going, monitor. Monitor what's happening. What is going, what is going, what isn't. You, you put advertisement in a newspaper, you don't know where that newspaper ends. Is somebody actually looking at your advertisement or just um, peeling potatoes and use it for the bin? You don't know. When you use it on social media, you see it. And you see your failures and you see your success. I, I analyze my statistics every day. And there are moments where I think, why is this not? This is so good. This is fantastic. And nobody is responding to it. What am I learning from it? Well. 
I, I start asking some people, some people I trust, and they will give me feedback and they say, well, uh, but this looks exactly the same as the thing you did yesterday. Ah, yeah, got it. Yep, you're right. I forgot about that. Or I post something and and suddenly people I never interacted with and suddenly there's like a wave of things happening and I don't know why. And I try to analyze that. I try to analyze the things I do good and the things I do wrong. And social media helps you with one very clear thing it helps you to step away from the feeling that you know what is working for other people or not because what you believe that works for other people is basically your own preference well social media is a very direct mirror you see it immediately and that's the, that's the benefit that's the power so embrace it please all the marketing people bring it to you don't fight it bring it to you use it you can do so many great things that's right. That's right. Any, um, you know, any featured tips that you would like to give for the social media marketing? Well, one thing that I always, for every part of marketing, I always um, tell everybody involved is don't focus on your preference. Focus on what works for your audience. Use the fact that social media gives you that feedback very fast. Mm. And the second thing is that what, what really is interesting in marketing, what has always, um, always intrigued me is that something can work today and it will not work tomorrow. On social media, that's not a problem because there will be 20 tomorrows because you do this, you do that, you do that. And, and if one of the things don't really work as well as you did, as you expected, don't worry too much about that because that is social media. Some things will, due to the algorithms, you, you hit a certain threshold and suddenly it's spread around the, the platform. And, and with something similar, which you thought it's going to be fantastic and you do the next day you don't hit that threshold and you're not spread around around the platform don't see it as a problem don't think that what works now will work again make the best of each and every individual thing you post make sure that you have something for every part of the audience and don't focus too much on the popularity of something. Because I learned that many, many years ago, and it had nothing to do with digital marketing because there were no, was no social media. There wasn't even internet. And now I'm starting to feel very old. But I learned it many, many years ago. It doesn't matter when 100,000 people hurt you, when the one person that is making the decision didn't hear you. So that also means if only 10 people heard you, what you had to say, but the one person who was making that decision actually heard what you had to say and say, hey, that's smart. I want to talk to that person. That's when you reached your goal. It isn't about the views, the likes, the tweets, the posts. That's not important. Reaching your target decision maker, reaching the person who will influence the decision making by making the proposal. That is what matters. Move away from the popularity counts. Yeah. That's my, my main advice to everybody involved in digital marketing, everybody who needs digital marketing, everybody who is considering digital marketing. What matters is the success of reaching the people you want to communicate with and not the people who seen it but are actually not interested yeah that's right it's to connect to the right people actually exactly exactly yeah. and um, like in this pandemic when everybody is like working from home i think social media can be leveraged better to engage with people definitely definitely because the two things two things happening besides people working from home they're also having their breaks at home 
And if you now have an entertaining message or a message that captivates them or a message that helps them understand something, a message that shows them, hey, there's the sunshine at the end of the tunnel. No matter what the message is, when that message gets attention during the breaks or, or whatever that happens, you've reached much more. And if you do that consistency, consistently, you reach much more for a long period of time that you, than you could have done with, with any other kind of, of advertisement or with any other kind of marketing. So use this opportunity. And I never want to call this pandemic an opportunity because it's horrible. But it is a situation we are confronted with. It's a situation we have to deal with. So now focus on what you can do and how you can contribute. That's right. Just make the best out of it. Exactly. Any other uh, sound bites you would like to... You know, leave for our viewers and listeners. Well, um, there are a couple of things which which are very very important to me, and and we spoke about uh, inclusion. We spoke about accessibility. There's one group who's using the internet significantly more intensive and significantly more curious than anybody else. Children. It is extremely important that we as the adults who hope that we understand a little bit what happens on the internet and with data and accessibility, that we start educating children as early as possible on safe usage of internet, safe usage um, of, of all kinds of services, privacy, cybersecurity, that they understand it, that's important. If, if we just take the example of TikTok, TikTok has conquered internet in no time. Yeah. It's amazing. It's impressive. Then there were all kinds of, oh, but it's Chinese and, and, and oh, security. What nobody focused on, and that's the horrible thing, what nobody focused on is privacy. Kids are showing themselves <laughs> to everybody. Yeah. What were we thinking? Why are we not educating those kids on, hey, listen, you can do this, but please do not do that. I have a program. It's on my website, um, Internet Safety for Kids. If you go to johannesdroograag.com, you will find it in the menu. It's two 10-minute videos. The first video is for the parents, that they learn to understand what they should focus on. And the second video is for the kids, but not for the kids to watch themselves, no, to watch it together with the parents so the communication starts. Mm -hmm. So this is my one of my highly important topics because I have children myself and I was also faced with the challenge. Hey, I think I understand what internet does, but my kids don't. And I see them use all kinds of things. And so that's the reason why I started developing it. The second thing is what we discussed today is accessibility and inclusion. Please, everybody, stop focusing on your optimal potential customer base and start focusing on your entire customer base. Yeah. And, and the third thing, and this is, this is my living message throughout my career, technology is great when we use it in the right way. And to use it in the right way, you need to help people, human beings like all of us, understand how to use it in the right way. And we need to put more focus on that. The technology is there to help us, not to replace us. It's not there to do the things that we are now being paid for. It is there to help us have a better life, to do things more efficient, to provide better services. And that will only be possible if we combine the human potential with technology. Yeah. We have to make sure that the people are part of the equation. That will never change, I hope. Yeah, that is actually, you know, the need of the hour, these things are. With, with right. developing, everybody should be developing and not just a section of the society. Exactly, exactly. And, and that applies to that applies to people who are currently living in countries where they do not have everything that, that the others have. Yeah. Uh, that applies to um, people living in countries with conflicts. That applies to 
people living in countries where not everybody is part of the happy few. That applies to people who are born with disabilities or people who, who get disabilities later in life. That applies to men and women. Um, we still have a pay gap. We still have, have all kinds of... Uh, I allegedly belong to the happy few. I'm, I'm male, I'm 58, and I'm white. But that's not the way my mother raised me. And it is, it is ridiculous, but it is reality of life. Well, I'm, I'm, not have, I'm not having the feeling that I have too many benefits out of it. But I do understand that there are a lot of people who don't have the benefits that I have because I belong to this apparently select group who make the decisions. We must change that. And technology can really, really help with that by informing people, educating people, showing all the wrong that is happening, showing the solutions for the things we can do. Focusing on the sustainable development goals, focusing on, on we're all in this together. This is our planet. We have one planet and, and we can either do it wrong or we can do it right. Thank you so much for all these insights. It was really helpful. And I think everybody who is listening and viewing will, will be, you know, will be having a good knowledge base to go forward with this. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you very much for this for this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to feedback. If there are questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, as I said before, engagement and conversation is important, and I live that myself. So, thank you for this opportunity.